on. Chief Petty Officer Stephen Arrington. From now on, you refer to yourself as Confinee Arrington. Is that clear? Yes, Sergeant. I understand you'd like to deal in marijuana, Arrington. Is that you? No, Sergeant. Weren't you just court-martialed for dealing in marijuana? Yes, Sergeant. From now on, you refer to me as Sir. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Finally, Arrington. Fire! Mark! To the right! Mark! Ho! Remove your shirt. Place it right here. to you. Where you going? Oh, that's right. He getting himself all spanky clean for his parole board. Ain't that sweet. I hear that something helps with the parole board. You know what that is? Huh? It's a little black and blue. Makes them sympathetic. Works every time. Guaranteed are your money back. Now, these two here, these are my new homies. That's black, that's blue. Oh, they here to hell. You getting in my face? I'm trying to give you a chance to get out of my face. Now move it. I'm in a hurry. <laughs> love it when you talk like that. Hey, don't y'all love it when you talk like that? Move it, the man is in a hurry, you heard it. Hit it turned down four today. I hope you're the fifth. Who am I gonna have to kick around if you're gone? I'll try not to disappoint you, Burns. Dress up day in a place called Boron, tucked away in the dry scrub of the Mojave Desert. Sometimes I considered it punishment enough that I, who loves the water as much as life, would have to spend three years locked up in the desert but that was my own brand of denial. I deserved to be locked up in Boron. I, I probably deserved a lot worse. The parole board had seen tens of thousands, just like me, dying to get out. 
willing to say anything or do anything just to be set free. But that's the irony. It was my willingness to do anything for a friend that got me in here in the first place. Arrington. It's a tough lesson to learn about yourself. But then, federal prison is one impressive classroom. Mr. Arrington, please sit down. My name is Frank Walters. I am the regional parole officer. On my left is Miss Ginger Wyrick, whom you know as your caseworker. Yes. And I'm sure you know Officer Lindsay. Yes, Officer Lindsay is my unit manager. Good. Now, Mr. Arrington, it is the purpose of this hearing to determine your eligibility for an early parole. My decision is based on factors such as your record at Terminal Island Federal Penitentiary and here at Boren Prison Camp, as well as my assessment of your rehabilitation while in prison. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Good. This is a formal hearing. My decision is final. No appeal is possible. So I encourage you to give us any information that you think may be helpful to your case. All right. Now, Ms. Wyrick has suggested that though we've already read your court papers, we briefly go back and look at the actions which led the court to its decision. This is a bit unusual, but I'm inclined to give some latitude, Ms. Wyrick. Thank you. I would like to point out Stephen's years of Navy service and his military awards for heroism and life-saving. That is noted, impressive. Now, according to your file, you were discharged from the Navy after having a court-martial for dealing marijuana when you were stationed in Hawaii. Is that correct? And though you were only caught once, it's, it's fair to assume, isn't it, that you were dealing on a regular basis and you just got caught? No, actually, I'd only been involved for less than two months. I was only dealing a small amount and just a friend, so I, I didn't take it that seriously. But nonetheless, you were caught stuffing a small amount into a toilet, and we can assume from that that this is not the only amount that you ever had. I think it's only fair to point out, Officer Lindsay, that this is the only blotch on his record, and he was honorably discharged. Thank you, Ms. Wyrick. Uh, what I'm trying to do is establish the beginnings of a pattern here. You would think that the experience would have taught you something. It did. And why'd you go out and get involved with one of the biggest drug smugglers in recent history? Well, actually, I, I had known Stuart Roth from years before when I taught him how to scuba dive. He was a very likable guy, and we became good friends. So when I got out of the brig and was released from the Navy, I thought, who better to give me a job? Yeah, who better than a heavyweight in the drug world? No. Who better than a friend? I respected Stuart. I, I looked up to him as a father figure. I, I had no clue whatsoever about his drug connections. The work that I did for him was legitimate. Until... Until what? Until that day, in the car, uh, in the desert above L.A. That's when the problem started. There were three of us. Me and Stuart, and a guy Stuart introduced as Max Escalante, who sat in the back and smelled like stale cigarettes. He didn't say much. I remember Stuart was edgy. But Stuart was always edgy. I figured that was just the way he was wired. Stephen, I got a problem. <laughs> yeah? So what else is new? <laughs> Look, I'm in, a, I'm in a bind. I really need your help. All right, sure. I mean, you got it still. Anything for you. Good. I want you to co-pilot the big plane for me tonight. Well, I'm not really checked out for a twin. I just need you to take over for stretch once in a while. And, yeah, it's, it's going to be a long trip. Yeah. Where are we going? Columbia. As in district, though? <laughs> no, as in South America, as in that powdery white stuff. <laughs> right. I'm serious, Steve. I won't do it, Stuart. That wasn't part of my deal. I can't believe that you even asked me. I mean, how long have you been running drugs? Hey, 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 come on, calm down. It's not a big deal, really. I move, uh, you know, a little coke on the side to keep us in cash. How else do you think we can live like this? Well, uh, what, what about Stewart Aviation? What about all the other businesses? It's legit. It's just not big enough for my two sons and me. What? Well, there are none of this, too? I wouldn't ask you to do anything I wouldn't ask them to do. Look, that's great. Then ask them. 
<laughs> You're like a son to me. Don't give me the sun garbage now, Stuart. I am not your son, and there is no way we had a problem. No, no, hey, no problem. We just said, uh, you know, working out the details. Perhaps I could be of some help. No, no offense, Mr. Escalante, but this doesn't concern you. Oh, but it does, huh? Because when it comes to family, nothing is more important to me. And, and Stuart is like family to me, like, like a brother, huh? Isn't that right, Stuart? Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, well, I'm not part of any family. Steve, certainly you know the importance of family, huh? How's your mother? <laughs> Let's just keep my mother out of this. <laughs> We're, uh... We're gonna get a lot of hand here, okay? Listen, listen, it's, it's really not a big deal. It'll only take a day or two. You'll be in, you'll be out, just like that. I'll never ask you to do this again, I promise. Come on, just make the trip. You get 50,000 for a few days' work, huh? Hey, I don't want your drug money, Stuart. You just keep your filthy hands off of me. Steven, the weather in my home country is beautiful this time of year, huh? And the people, you're gonna love the people. Maybe you want to stay, huh? Just keep him away from my family. Or I swear, I will. No problem. Really? So you went. What else can I do? Not go. You perceived Escalante's threat as real? At the very least, he was unpredictable. Like a shark. I, I just couldn't take the chance. And we're supposed to believe that the money had nothing to do with it. Now, I mean, the threat against his family seems awfully convenient when you realize there was $50,000 at stake. The record shows Mr. Arrington never took possession of the money. Yes, but he didn't know that at the time, did he? The bottom line is that he went. Now, oh, again, your guilt is not in question here. No. It's not. You're right, I did go. Stretch and I flew the plane to a cartel hideout in the northern part of Colombia and picked up 650 pounds of pure cocaine. <clears throat> Worth about a quarter billion dollars on the street. A quarter of a billion dollars? That's right. I, I didn't know how much it was worth. I was too busy just trying to keep it together. Flight down there got pretty dicey, and I half expected never to see home again. And home was all I could think about. Stretch the Fearless, our illustrious pilot, had timed it so the control tower was closed. The airport would be basically deserted. As we descended to pattern altitude for our approach, I remember looking beyond the airport lights to the vast barrenness of the Mojave. At night, from the air, the desert looks like the ocean. For once, I was actually glad to see it. We had flown through violent thunderstorms under radar covered zigzagging between offshore oil wells to fool the DEA. We had loaded the belly of the twin with more than a quarter ton of uncut Colombian cocaine under the watchful eye of compadres cradling automatic weapons. Our own compadres were waiting for us, cradling their automatic weapons. <laughs> it was no different. Turns out when you smuggle for a living, the whole concept of friend and enemy gets a little fuzzy. All right, great flight, buddy. Let's do it again soon, huh? I just want to get out of here. It goes that way. Arrington. Hey, 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 hold it, hold it. Where do you think you're going? Out. And not without this. Stuart wants you in Miami in the morning. Be there. I felt exhausted, confused, betrayed. And what's worse, I, I knew I'd turned a corner. I couldn't go back to being who I was. That person didn't exist anymore. And for what? For all the times in his life that Officer Lindsay had been right, this time, he was dead wrong. I didn't care about the money. All I wanted was to get out of there alive, just walk away clean, disappear. 
So when you were finally alone, why don't you just take off? Why'd you go to Miami? It's a good question, Mr. Arrington, and one that frankly concerns me greatly. I can understand your involvement up until this point because of a perceived threat. I mean, if an explanation will help you in this hearing, please do so. Otherwise, we can just move on. All right, just please understand that I'm not trying to justify my choice. I called Stuart to ask him for some money. Well, that sounds like a good plan to me. Get you $50,000 and then run. This had nothing to do with the 50000 No, not really. I, I, I was still pretty scared. So you went to Miami, then what happened? Well, Stuart had gone back to California, leaving me with hardly anything. So I just kept working on the yacht, waiting for him to get in touch. He finally phoned me and, and told me to go to Max's house in Miami to pick up $10,000 to finish the work on the boat. So I went to Max's. It was my first time there, so naturally the reception was cordial. Fernando, te dije sin fuerza, eh? Eres estúpido. Hablamos después. Steven, forgive my help, eh? We have been waiting for you. Come in, come in. It's nice to see you. Sí, sí, please. Nice work in Colombia, eh? Not so bad, eh? Mm. You like some mango? Mm. Beer. Fernando, bring some beer for our friend. No, 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 thank you. I, I can't really stay. Well, at least have some water, huh? I hate to drink alone. Fernando, water. So, Steven, I need for you to give a brief message to Stuart for me. A message? It's a little one, eh? Can't you just call him? Steven, just tell Stuart I need to dump that pilot stretch, huh? He's a drunk, and uh, he talks a lot, too much. Stretch? You want to fire Stretch? Oh, fire? No, 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 no. <laughs> we want to dump him, huh? Forever. It's nothing very painful, at least not for very long. Is there a problem? What? I say, is there a problem? I was hoping that there would be no problems. Listen, uh, I just came for the money. Forgive me. Pedro, come in here. Pedro. This is my brother-in-law's boy, Pedro. He's learning the family business, huh? And very well, too, huh? He's, he's a good boy. Come on. Don't point that thing at me. He knows this thing better than I do, huh? There we go. Have you ever used a Mac 10, Steven? It's the input. It's not very efficient, but it's dandy at close range. Kill him! Everyone who works for me obeys me, Stephen. Everyone. You can see that now, can't you? In Colombia, we have a saying, it is silver or lead. You take the money or a bullet in the head. Pedro, give him the money. Now, about the message for Stuart. Hey, then why don't you just call him for yourself? Why haven't you heard? He's under investigations. Someone will probably listen on the phone right now, Stephen. But I mean, I won't be seeing him. Oh, yes, you will. You went to California. Did I forget to tell you? I apologize, huh? There's a car waiting outside even as we speak. What's in the car, Max? More with the questions, huh? Perhaps it would be best for you to get on the way to see your family as soon as you can. What's in the car, Max? It's a fine car, Steve. 
full of amenities, huh? In fact, it's loaded. <laughs> it seems to me this would have been a good time for you to turn yourself in. <laughs> yeah. Bad move on my part, no question. One of many. All I can say is that I was scared for my life. What Max said about Stretch terrified me. So I came up with a plan. It was not a good one, I admit, but let's face it. I wasn't thinking straight anyway. Yeah, it's good to hear your voice too, Mom. What's that? Yeah. I, someday. No, no, I, I won't be coming to California anytime soon. There's too much work to do for Stuart, you know. Yeah, of course I'm taking care of myself. Don't worry. Mom! I, I miss you. Yeah. I love you too, Mom. Somewhere in the Midwest, I came upon a church. I don't know why I stopped. Maybe I just needed to stretch my legs. Maybe I thought that this church, any church, would be like a foreign embassy for God. All I needed to do was pound on the door and ask for a diplomatic asylum. Instead of divine intervention, all I got was a guy with a mop. Somehow it didn't seem like the answer I was looking for. Maybe I shouldn't have been so picky. By the time I made California, it was late. In reality, it was a lot later than I thought. Who would I become? Where was that little boy who dreamed of swimming with brightly colored fish? his eyes filled with wonder. And what would he think of me? I guess it really didn't matter now. He had died along with the rest of my dreams. So what was left? Close the curtains bolt the door, douse the lights, move on. I guess that's what a smuggler does. My plan was like a simple story problem stretched across the San Fernando Valley. The people in hotel room A were expecting car B loaded with C. So I parked the car at D, the Burbank airport, and gave them the keys. If they wanted it, they could go get it. Then one of them, some guy named Louie, sticks a Beretta in my side and tells me to drive. I guess Louie didn't like story problems. Stephen, I don't need to tell you. Anything goes on here, anything at all, I'll kill you in a heartbeat. You screwed up once tonight, don't do it again. Now get out of the car and show me the cocaine. in the back seat.
You move, you die. Stephen, I'm a federal agent. You're under arrest. Probably not the best day of your life, huh, creep? Actually, I think it is. Come on. In Los Angeles, federal drug agents working undercover have broken a cocaine smuggling ring believed to involve automaker John DeLorean. Sources close to the investigation say the revenues may have been used to save the financially troubled automaker's car company. The 600 pounds of uncut Colombian cocaine was seized late last night from a car in the parking lot of Burbank Airport. Hey, hey, buddy. <laughs> Man, you won't blame me for this, do you? Hey, I had no clue, man. But don't worry, huh? don't worry. We'll be out of this in a few hours. I got some people working on it. Did you tell them anything? Yes, Stuart. Told them everything. What'd you think? You better be kidding. Because if you're not... If not what, Stuart? What? Shh. This room is probably bugged. Ask me if I care. I have nothing to hide! Just tell me what you told them. I haven't told them anything. Good. All right. That's my boy. All right, now. Right, let's not panic, okay? We'll get out of this. We'll get out of this, okay? I can, I can make a deal. Everyone likes to make a deal. Um, At that moment, I couldn't care less about Stewart's deal. He had lied to me. He had suckered me. He had told me that's what friendship required. I was here because of him. No. That was part of the lie. I was here because of me. I had never run away. I'd never even walked away. And now I could do neither. Stuart kept babbling on about making a deal, and I thought to myself, Stuart, buddy, that's a great idea. Make your own deal. My deal starts now. Tell me, Mr. Harrington, why you refuse to testify against the others? Well, they're scared, right? Bad things can happen in Terminal Island, and often do, and his friends had contacts on the inside. Yes, I was scared. But I was more afraid of what I might become if I cooperated. Your cooperation could have helped the war on drugs. And there wasn't anything that I could say that the feds didn't already know, because Stuart and his sons and, and everyone else had already cooperated. I wanted to take responsibility for my own actions. I needed to do the time. Your time at Terminal Island, after you were sentenced. Tell us about that. Well, there's nothing much to tell. Prison's a rough place. I have the same problems as anyone else. Record's good. Says you're a model inmate. Yeah. I tried to fade into the background. It was kind of tough. The case had drawn so much attention. This may sound like a simplistic question, but did you learn anything useful in prison? Did I learn anything? Yeah. I learned about the kid down the cell block from me who died after being raped. Repeatedly. Because he wasn't strong. And if you're not strong, you become a plaything. I learned how it feels to be victimized myself after being very nearly gang-raped in the workout room. Morning sun shining happily in the whole while. And I learned about blood. That smell of it, the, the feel. That color that your mind never really washes away. Day room, now!
What happened? Soap out the fight. Clean it up. In prison, it was just another business transaction. Power gets brokered in odd ways. A look, an attitude. Somebody's got something to settle and somebody gets cut for wanting to watch a different soap. It's the price you pay in prison. I kept remembering the sign on that country church, the blood can set you free. I realized I was covered with it. And this time, I was the guy with the mop. The thought of that church led to a premise. Redemption implied worth. People redeem coupons or crushed aluminum cans. They aren't worth much, but they're worth something. And I knew in my heart that I was still worth something. There was no blinding light from heaven. No choirs of angels sang. And no one who looked at me could have guessed that anything much had happened. But it had. And when I asked, are you there for me? One word came softly to my mind. Always. Harrington, have you any idea how many conversion stories we hear in this room? No, I have no idea. I can tell you that it makes no difference in my decision. Well, I do think it helps to underscore Stephen's exemplary record at Terminal Island. Oh, come on, Terminal Island is one thing, but moving him to Boron, a minimum security facility, was, in my opinion, a mistake. A mistake? The man was not ready for transfer to a minimum security facility, and I said so at the time. And as it turned out, I was right. How so? He defied authority, and he broke out of camp. What? It's in the report. I wrote it myself. Well, I would hardly call that breaking out. You used your position as head of the fire department to leave the security facility when you've been told not to. That's what well, I would call breaking out. Wait a minute. You know there were emergency circumstances. Every call to the fire department is an emergency. This man was pulled off the patrol one time, and he was given another Stop. opportunity, and you blew it. My men helped save the lives of two Air Force crewmen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in the process, he, he, he radioed in that a B-1 bomber had crashed. And consequently, the newspapers got the story that an inmate crew was there first and all of the other respondents were made to look bad. So you pulled him off the force? Correct. Later, he was reinstated with the proviso that he not leave the camp. He could train the men, he could keep them in shape, but he was told he could not leave the facility. And that is exactly what you did. Oh, I wish I could, man, but you know the rules. You guys will do fine without me. Come on, man, it's time to get the Come on! Huh? Let's move it! I'm in a hurry! Why will you talk like that? We can't free her. She's pinned in behind the wheel. She's going into shock. I get a saw. No, no, no power saw. There's too much gasoline. The whole car will blow. We gotta do something fast. Our pulse is getting weaker. Burns, get the hutch bar. And cut the seat belts. We're gonna pull it. <laughs> Hi. I'm Steven. How you doing in there? I'm going to lose my baby. No, you're not. No, you're not. Okay, listen, what's your name? It's Karen. Okay, Karen. Now I want you to listen to me. Are you listening? First thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna pull this door, okay? Let's do it, Burns. Okay. All right. That much closer. Karen, listen to me now. You listening to me? Okay. I'm gonna get you out of here and your baby. I'm so scared. It's all right to be scared. It's okay. It's gotta be 
brave for me too, Karen. All right, you got to do this for your baby. Can you do that for me? Okay. All right, listen. This is what we're gonna do. Hey, you remember when you were a little kid and to get rid of a loose tooth, you wrapped a string around it and then tied the other end to a doorknob and slammed the door shut? You remember that? Yeah. Okay, that's what we're gonna do to the steering wheel. We're gonna pull it like a tooth. Hey, Burns, give me a blanket. I'm gonna put a blanket over you now, Karen. We're gonna take this windshield out, okay? So don't get any glass on you. Just take us a second. Out of girl. Okay, Burns, Craig, let's pull this windshield. Okay. All right, that a girl, Karen. Hang in there. We're almost there. Try and relax. Give me your hand. All right, let's do it, Burns. Ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> there you go, Karen. It's all over. We can take you out now. You're gonna be just fine. Thank God. Yeah, exactly. Just one question, Arrington. Were you told not to leave the prison grounds? Yes, I was. And did you go? Someone was dying. I couldn't stay. The point is that you broke the rules. Officer Lindsay, you've made your point. It's just a bad one. But what do you mean a bad one, Miss Wyrick? The man saved lives. It's not like he was running away. If anything, he was acting responsibly. I'm not sure I agree with that. His motives were good. How do you know? How do you know what his motives were? Maybe he would have run away if he could. But he didn't. He had plenty of opportunity. And the police were there. Did you ever think of that? What about the lives he saved? Yeah, and what about those that he ruined with cocaine? He's done his time. All right. All right. Now, the bottom line is that he left without permission. That has to be considered. I just have one question for Officer Lindsay. What, sir, would you have done in his place? I think we've come to an end. Mr. Arrington, is there anything else you'd like to say on your behalf? Uh, only that I felt that I was answering to someone higher than Officer Lindsay when I did what I did. Okay, you may go, and we'll discuss your case. I want to tell you myself, it's over. Oh, uh, better not disappoint me, Arrington. You come back here again, things won't go easy for you. My brother was waiting for me just outside the gate with the Baja bug. And for a moment, it seemed like none of it had happened. It was just like before. We were kids again, out on summer vacation, heading off to the beach.
I know that the others have made their deals, copped their pleas, and paid their lawyers. And that would be between them and God. It didn't concern me anymore. It was graduation day, and that wasn't all. The boys had planned a little graduation surprise. It's funny where friends can be found. In three years, it hadn't rained much in Boron, but now it felt like enough water to wash away everything that had happened before. The memories of Escalante, Stuart, Stretch, the betrayal of a best friend, the fear and the recrimination. And those waters, those healing waters, drenched all that away. I was that little boy standing in the spray from the garden hose, awakened from the daydream of diving and fish and what it would be like to be a real diver. The one thing that I didn't plan on was, <laughs> well, sometimes you gotta be careful what you pray for.